you watch my daily Stevo Devo on our church Facebook page, then you already know that we're starting a new sermon series today, Sync Up. This is a sermon series on prayer. The whole idea of Sync Up, like you saw the dancers there in the sermon bumper, has to do with music, helps a dancing partner stay in sync or synchronized with each other. Otherwise, like a Sue Smith has a line dancing class on Saturday mornings, and if they're out of sync, then she might do si do and he's going to do si don't And so we want to stay in sync together. And, and what that music is to the dancers, that's what prayer is to our, our life with the Lord. So whenever I start a new sermon series, I like to start with why. Why? We're going to get into the how and maybe some... Um, some advice on how to build out our prayer lives, but I want to start with why. If we, if we buy into the why, then usually we'll figure out the how and we'll do the what. So today, all I want to do is 10 reasons why everyone needs a prayer life. 10 reasons everyone needs a vital and a flourishing prayer life, even atheists. I read a study last week that said 20% of atheists and agnostics pray every day. I don't know what that's all about, but they need to pray just like we need to pray. So here we go. Reason number one is kinesis. The first reason is kinesis. You say, oh, Steve, is it going to be that kind of a sermon? Yes, it is. Now, kinesis is a biological term, and it means motion, and typically motion in response to stimulus. So the sunlight hits the amoeba, and the amoeba moves. That's kinesis. And the idea here is that when we pray, and as soon as we pray, that sets God to motion. He sets the wheels in motion to answer our prayer. The instant that we pray for our kids or our finances or some tragedy, God begins to work, sets things in motion. You say, Steve, where did you get that from? From the Bible. For instance, in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is praying for understanding of a certain situation. And God sends the angel Gabriel to give him the answer to his prayer. And this is what we read, Daniel 9, 23. Gabriel says to Daniel, as soon. As you began to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you. So in the very day that Daniel was praying, the angel was sent, and he received the answer to that prayer. In the next chapter, in Daniel chapter 10, once again, Daniel is praying. He's fasting and praying for three weeks about a question that he has. And after three weeks, God sends the angel Gabriel, and Gabriel's got another message for Daniel, and it reads like this, Daniel 10, 12, since the first day. You began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God. Your request has been heard in heaven, and I have come in answer to your prayer. From the first day. Now, Daniel did not perceive the answer to his prayer until three weeks after he had started, but God had already begun answering it on the first day. Now, when we pray, we might perceive an answer on the day we're praying, or it might take three weeks, or there might be three months, or three years, or 30 years, or it might not be till after we die and go to heaven that we look back and see what God was doing in response to our prayer. But know this, kinesis, when we pray, God starts to work immediately. Number two, reason number two, everybody needs a prayer life for mojo, for mojo. Now, In the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, Jesus' disciples were attempting to cast a demon out of a possessed boy. The father was desperate. This demon was trying to kill the boy, throwing him into the water, trying to drown him, burn him in the fire. The disciples were unsuccessful. Here comes Jesus. Jesus casts the demon out. And later on, the disciples asked Jesus, why couldn't we cast him out? We've cast out other demons before. And Jesus' answer was, this particular kind of demon only comes out with prayer. The interesting thing is that when Jesus cast the demon out, he didn't pray a prayer. He didn't pray the demon out. There was no prayer involved. So what's he talking about? What we infer that what Jesus is talking about is that Jesus lived a lifestyle of daily discipline prayer. And that lifestyle had a cumulative effect, building up his power, his mojo, as I'm calling it, in the spiritual realm. So on that day, there was only one person who could handle that kind of a demon. It was the man of prayer. Now, we have kids, grandkids. Most good parents will do just about anything to protect their kids. Are they under demonic attack today? <laughs> sure they are. You know what's going on in the world today. We do just about anything for them. We might send them to a private school or or homeschool them or take them to Sunday school and a youth group or buy them a bulletproof backpack. 
or put an Apple Air tag on their shoelace, and all that's fine. But you know what? All children need, all children need the power of a praying parent and a grandparent in their life who has spiritual mojo to go into battle for them. Everybody needs a prayer life. Number three, rewards. Rewards, because we're rewarded for a prayer life. I just finished an entire sermon series, right, on rewards. Don't make me play that rapping sermon bumper music again. <laughs> so rewards. So, for instance, Jesus said, when you go into your closet and you have that quiet prayer time where nobody else sees, God sees, and he will reward you. So we get rewarded when we pray. There's a husband and wife been married for 60 years, great marriage, no secrets, except that the wife had a, a wooden box up there in the top of her closet, and she told her husband, don't ever ask me about that. Well, after you know, 60 years, and she got sick, and it looked like it was serious, so the husband says, you know, honey, maybe it's time that you told me about the box. She said, you know what, I, I think maybe that's true. And so he went and got the box down, and they opened it up, and they looked inside. Inside the box were two little doilies and $25,000. He said, honey, what's this all about? She said, well, I'll tell you, on the day we got married, my grandmother gave me advice. She said, here's the secret to a happy marriage. When you get angry with your husband, she said, don't yell at him. Just pray a little prayer and knit a little doily, which warmed his heart. He said, two little doilies. But he said, all right, honey, that, that explains the doilies. Well, what about the $25,000? She says, oh, that's the money I got from selling all the doilies. So when we pray, there's a blessing now and a reward later on. Rewards. All right, four. We're talking about ten reasons. Everybody needs a prayer life. Number four is peace. In Philippians, Paul writes, don't worry about anything but pray about everything. With thankful hearts, offer up your prayers and requests to God. And then because you belong to Christ Jesus, God will bless you with peace that no one can completely understand. Hey, remember in Mark chapter 4, Jesus and the disciples are going across the Sea of Galilee. The storm whips up. The waves start to swamp the boat. The disciples are panicked that the boat's going to sink. Jesus is asleep in the boat. He's asleep in the stern. Finally, they're, they're so desperate, they wake Jesus up. Don't you care? We're about to drown. And Jesus stands up, says, peace be still, and he calms, he calms the sea. Now, I was thinking about that in contrast with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he, Jesus is in prayer, and he asks the disciples if they will wait with him in prayer. Will you pray with me one hour? And, and they just couldn't do it. The spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak, and they, they kept falling asleep. But Jesus prayed. And when I was thinking about these two incidents in contrast, this phrase came to my mind, that Jesus slept while others panicked because Jesus prayed while others slept. What keeps us up at night? Is it anxiety? Is it worry? Or is it prayer? The answer to that question determines whether we live with peace or with panic. Everyone needs a prayer life for peace. Now here's a fifth reason. Power. Power. So the power of the Christian life comes from the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. All Christians have the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when the apostle Peter preached the first gospel sermon, he concludes it saying, repent, let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. All Christians have that. Something nobody in the Old Testament ever had that. Adam did not have that. Enoch didn't have the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. Noah didn't have it. Uh, Daniel, David, Moses, that's something new under the new covenant. We have the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, what's he doing in there? Well, what's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? Power. So the knowledge, the truth, the doctrine all comes from the Word of God. But the power to live the Christian life comes from the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And the way we engage the power of the Holy Spirit is through prayer. Now, I want to read you just a half a dozen scriptures here to make that impression on our minds. I want us to see in these scriptures, I'm going through them really quick, the connection between prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 3, as Jesus was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him. 
Luke 11, Jesus says, How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Acts 4, after this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Ephesians 3, I pray that from His glorious unlimited resources, God will empower you with inner strength through His Spirit. Ephesians 6, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Jude 20, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. When we pray, our Spirit intersects with the Holy Spirit. We awaken the sleeping giant of Holy Spirit power within us. Those in recovery appeal to a higher power. We're all in recovery from sin. We must appeal to the one true higher power who is the Holy Spirit. I used to have a motorcycle. And early in the morning, I would back the motorcycle out of the garage and halfway down the driveway before starting it up so as not to awaken the sleeping inhabitants of my house. And one time I'd backed it down the driveway, not realizing that the battery was dead. And I tried to start it, wouldn't start. So then I had to push it back up the driveway and into the garage. If the motorcycle weighs 550 pounds. And I can tell you that it's a lot more fun to ride the motorcycle with the wind blowing through my hair, <laughs> hypothetically speaking, than it is to push the motorcycle got to have the power. And it's a lot more fun to ride the Christian life and the power of the Holy Spirit than it is to push through and grind it out. And that is determined by our prayer life. All right. Ten reasons why everyone needs a prayer life. How are we doing on time? Terrible. All right, I got five more reasons to go. Number six, healing. James 5.16. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. In Isaiah chapter 38, King Hezekiah was sick. He realized that it was terminal. He prayed to God. God extended his life another 15 years. He did that by a combination of divine healing power and a medicinal poultice. It was medicine in combination with God's divine healing healing power, answer to prayer. Theologian Jack Cottrell writes, in individual cases, God can and sometimes does intervene, heals, eases pain, slows down a killer disease, or gives new insight to doctors, or gives inner peace. Thus, we should always pray for God to intervene. This is one point James is making. The prayer of faith will restore the sick. We should never cease offering these prayers up to him. I imagine almost everyone in this room could give examples of times when we prayed for someone who was sick and God healed them and God restored them to health. Lots of examples. And probably most everyone in this room could also give examples of when they prayed for someone and, and God did not respond to that prayer by healing them. In the Old Testament, King David prayed for his infant son who was sick for healing. He was not healed, and the infant son died. Well, does that mean that we should stop praying for healing because God does not respond with healing 100% of the time? That would be foolish. Do the doctors heal us 100% of the time? Absolutely not. Do we stop going to the doctor? No, we don't. In 2010, David Friedman wrote a book entitled Wrong, Subtitle, Why Experts Keep Failing Us and How to Know When Not to Trust Them. Part of what's revealed in that book is two-thirds of the findings published in top medical journals are refuted within a few years. Ninety percent of physicians' medical knowledge has been gauged to be substantially or completely wrong. Most major drugs don't work on 40 to 75 percent of the population. A drug widely prescribed for years to heart attack victims killed more Americans than did the Vietnam War. I'm not anti-doctor, I'm pro-doctor, but here's what I know about doctors. Doctors need God's help to heal. And so we go to the doctor and we pray. And everybody needs a prayer life for healing. Here's another reason, is growth. 
Seventh reason, growth. Philippians 1, nine. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. So we pray for growth, and the, the act of praying is a catalyst for growth. So I was reading last week about something called a quinceañera. In some Hispanic communities, they have a quinceañera for a young girl who's transitioning in her 15th year to become a woman. A quinceañera means the 15th year. So on her 15th birthday, they have little rituals and traditions. For instance, she gives away her last doll, you know, symbolizing her childhood is coming to an end. Usually the day begins with the young lady with her parents in worship, in church, and often the parents give her a ring symbolizing her commitment to God. It's a, it's a religious ceremony, but it is demonstrating her intent to grow up and become a woman. Now, that's going to happen physically to the body, whether someone wants it to or not. But there are a lot of people, while they grow up physically, they never grow up maturity-wise or spiritually. The Apostle Paul wrote, when I was a child, Spoke like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. When I became a man, or in this case a woman, I gave up childish things. Well, a lot of adults are still, they're still children, still playing games, or still getting drunk, or going out and partying, and not taking responsibility, and not engaging with God. A quinceañera demonstrates, I want to grow up. And likewise, prayer. When we commit ourselves to prayer, we're saying, you know what? I'm not going to be a kid anymore. I'm going to get in here and intentionally take this step of spiritual growth. Everybody needs a prayer life. Reason number eight, intercession. Intercession. Suppose somebody comes to you. My child's in the ER. It's a very critical situation. Can you help? Or somebody says, my teenage daughter is pregnant. She's abortion-minded. Can you help? Or, or somebody says, you know, we were in a, that path of that tornado. Our, our home's been ripped apart. Can you help? How many times are we faced with situations where we just feel impotent? <laughs> we can't heal. We don't have the resources to give. We can't resolve the problem. In those times, God calls us into those situations to be an intercessor in prayer. Jesus told a whole parable about this in Luke 11:5. He says, suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread, and you say to him, a friend of mine's just arrived for a visit. I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night. My family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he'll get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And then Jesus says, so I tell you, keep on asking, and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds. To everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Those words, ask, seek, knock, that we're so familiar with, were given in the context of interceding for other people. We can't, but God can. Can you imagine that happening in your neighborhood or with your neighbors? In my neighborhood, my neighbors are Ernie and Judy Miller. Anybody know Ernie and Judy Miller, retired minister? They go to the 830 service. If I had midnight company come unexpectedly, we don't have any food, Publix is closed. I walk across the street to Ernie and Judy's house. Hey, wake up in there. I can just picture it inside. Judy's kicking Ernie. Ernie, wake up. There's something going on. You got to get up and explore. Ernie says, hoo, hoo. Come on, Ernie, there's somebody down there that, at the door. So Ernie gets up and he goes to, looks through the people. Steve Jones, what are you doing out there? Ernie, help me out. I got company. We got no food. You got to help me. No, go away. Right, Ernie was hard enough to be your neighbor in the middle of the day. Especially in the middle of the night. Well, I keep knocking and he's, he's going to give me something. And, and you get the point. They, they give you the shirt off their back. But you get the point. We can't. But God can. In those times of impetus, impotence, we, we, don't, we don't have the resources. We can't heal. We can't fix. But we call God into the situation on their behalf. In the Old Testament, Moses interceded for the nation of Israel. They were about to come under God's judgment and be destroyed. And the Bible says but because Moses prayed, God changed his mind. He spared that nation. You are Moses in your neighborhood in your family, in our church. We are Moses, the intercessors, if we have a prayer life, intercession. All right, 10 reasons. Everybody needs a prayer life. Number nine is the church, because of the church. 
You know what the number one cause of having a lame church is? Prayerlessness. Prayerless. If the church is lame, it's usually because of a lack of prayer. For instance, Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 is asking for Ephesian Christians to pray for him. He says, pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain the God's mysterious plan. Colossians 4, he asks the Colossians, pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. He's the preacher. He's basically saying, pray for me so that God will give me a good sermon. So I say, if the sermon is lame, don't blame me. Look in the mirror. I blame you people. Somebody out there is not praying for me. But that is not seriously. That's not just, a, that's meant to be funny. It wasn't that funny after all. But that's not just true of the sermon. Evangelism, growth, unity, service, love. No revival happens in the church. No energy happens in the church unless people in the church are praying. We're all praying for the church. Everybody needs to have a prayer life. And number 10 is connection. Here's the last one, connection. Jesus said in John 15, I am the true grapevine. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask. Here's the prayer. You may ask anything you want and it will be granted. Prayer is the way we stay connected to the vine. If we're not connected, we can't produce any fruit. Somebody gets their cell phone out and they're doing this. What are they doing? They're, they're looking for a signal. They're trying to get connected. Connected to the Wi-Fi, connected to the cloud, connected to the Internet. The connection in here is terrible. Pam Karsanovich was out there this morning doing this, trying to get a connection. Because the worst thing that can happen to a modern American is to not be connected. Right? You can't talk to anybody, you can't text anybody, you can't play any games, can't get on Facebook or TikTok or Twitter. You're dead in the water. It's called a dead zone. Dead. Can't produce, can't work. Dead. And prayer connects us with God. And without that connection, we're dead. Jesus said, you're not connected to the vine, you can't produce any fruit. Can't produce anything good. It's not going to happen. Work as hard as you want to. It's not going to happen. We have to have a connection. All right, 10 reasons. We all, and, and 10 reasons. Everybody needs a prayer life. There are 10 more. Those are just the first 10 that came to my head as I was writing this message. I had to leave a bunch out. Now, I, I want us to conclude today, and we're going to do this after every message in this series, to say together the Lord's Prayer. That's going to be the foundation of our series. There are a lot of different patterns and forms for prayer. And again, we'll get to how to build out a prayer life. But the Lord's Prayer, it's like the, the scales in music. You learn those scales. And then from that, you can start to build out any variety of music. You learn the letters of the alphabet. And from that, you can, you know, Shakespeare can write poetry. Or you got the 10 numbers. You got the 10 numbers the, in the 10 decimal system. And, and from that, Einstein can build out a theory of relativity. But there's got to be the basics. We always start with the basics. And to me, this is, this is the great basic right here, is the Lord's Prayer. Now, your assignment, should you choose to accept it, is pray this Lord's Prayer every day. Just start praying this every day. Maybe in, in addition to what you I know we are, I know we have people who pray here. We have people in this congregation who can stand up here and give a master class on prayer. I don't mean to imply otherwise. We have also have some people that really struggle. So here's the starting point. If we pray the Lord's Prayer every day, if we just read it every day, what will happen is we'll start to memorize it. And once we have memorized it, then we have a tool. Then we have the scaffolding upon which to build out a flourishing, powerful prayer life. So let's put the, the prayer up there on the screen, the particular version that we're going to say together. And would you say this with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. On June 28, 2005, Commander Michael Murphy and his SEAL team were pinned down by Taliban fighters in Afghanistan. They needed to get a message to their HQ for help, but they couldn't get a signal out in the mountainous terrain. Commander Murphy left cover and moved to a clearing away from the mountains, exposing himself to a hail of gunfire to get a clear signal for his satellite phone. He synced up, made the connection. He dropped the phone after being shot more than 14 times, but picked it back up and finished the call. Murphy signed off saying thank you, and then continued fighting from his exposed position until he died from his wounds. Jesus Christ died to establish our connection to God the Father. When we pray in His name, God always hears. Today as we sync up in the Lord's Supper, let's remember.